Once again, the voice of uh, Professor Kaku. Professor, welcome back to the program. Art, glad to be back on again. Uh, happy to have you, as always. All right, I'm going to lay it out for you, and I'm, I'm going to ask you just the way I asked the audience. Right now, uh, if you read tonight's news, let's see, um, there's a story about Iraq planning to destroy all its oil fields, food supplies, power plants, kill a bunch of civilians, and then blame the whole damn thing on the U.S. bombing, should a war begin. There is another story about uh, our president who uh, says now Saddam has missed his last chance to come clean with the world. And they're saying that there may be a material breach, you know, in the 12,000-page uh, document turned over. They found a material, or they're arguing about whether there's a material breach. It looks like the president's going to war. Gold just went higher than it's been in a whole long time. The economy is uh, in very tough shape anticipating the war. Seems like war um, is absolutely inevitable. We're doing this little dance with the UN, but you know Britain is actually beginning to mobilize their troops now. It looks so certainly like war to me, and uh, and so I was asking my audience the following question. I think it's a really good one. So far, you know, I've heard it said that Saddam has weapons of mass destruction, or might have them, or something, but we haven't been shown the proof of that specifically yet. I, I, I sort of feel that, you know, if he's got them and we know he's got the intent to use them, then there might be justification for us to be going to war. Um, but if we don't, if people aren't told actually why they're going to war, I, I, I don't know that they'll like that. And, and you know, history has shown that uh, the American people don't like it when we, when we go to war and we don't understand fully why we're doing it. That's, that's a pretty good precedent back there in Vietnam. And so my question to you is, um, are you willing to uh, support this country, America, going to war against Iraq, even though you uh, do not specifically understand why we're doing it? In other words, we know what they've got. Even if we gave it to them or some stupid thing like that, whatever. Uh, do you have enough information now to say we should be going to war? Well, I think you asked the big question. You know, as Winston Churchill once said, uh, when you, if you're about to go to war, you have to understand the full consequences of what, what you're unleashing on the world. Um, two things. Uh, first of all, there could be a backlash against us throughout the Middle East, even bigger than the one that already exists. And just remember that uh, Pakistan is just barely holding on right now with the pro-Western government. And if the government of Pakistan is ever toppled, just remember that they have about, two, about 20 uh, nuclear weapons in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can stop talking about, you know, half-assembled or quarter-assembled atomic bombs or pieces of atomic bombs. Uh, Pakistan has about 20 fully assembled atomic bombs that could fall into the wrong hands. Do you have any idea how big they are, by the way? Just... Uh, these are Hiroshima-sized uh, Hiroshima. nuclear weapons. Uh, about five of them or so were detonated several years ago in the face of India's nuclear weapons just to prove to the world that Pakistan can, in fact, detonate Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. So they would be bombs that would destroy an entire city. That's right. Uh, right. We're talking about approximately uh, 20 kilotons, 20,000 tons of TNT. Yeah. Imagine 20,000 boxcars of dynamite, okay? Uh, that's like several miles long caravan of dynamite, and that's what you can do to a modern metropolitan city. And Pakistan has on the order of about 20 of these nuclear weapons that could fall in the wrong hands. So there's a lot of there's a lot at stake. Not to mention, of course, the government of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Jordan, oh. all pro-U.S. Well, I don't know. Wait, well, right now, well, now, wait a minute. There, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I don't think you know. Uh, Professor, I don't think uh, Saudi Arabia is pro-U.S. at all. Um, they they give a little bit of lip service to that, but but frankly, uh, Saudi Arabia has financed a lot of the nasty doings that have gone on. Uh, they they really have. Yeah, but take a look at the big picture. Okay, the big picture is Pretty that big. we have relative stability there because Saudi Arabia. You know, has the hand on the spigot, as they say. Oh, they do. And, uh, you know, so far it's been relatively stable for the West. Yeah. So I think we have to look at the second big issue, not just the consequences of what happens if Jordan, Egypt, and Pakistan get destabilized. We also have to look at the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Let's not dance around this or that. Let's talk about what's really at stake, and that is oil. 
That's how we got into this mess when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait yeah, to, yeah. to take control of the oil supplies in that area. Yeah. But it's really about oil. That is the architecture of our U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. That's what it's all about. And my particular point of view is that we should gradually wean ourselves away from oil. Oil gets us into big trouble. Oil exacerbates the greenhouse effect with global warming. Oil also puts us in bed with dictatorships like the one in Egypt and feudal monarchies like the one in Saudi Arabia. Oil gets us into big trouble because that's what this whole war is really all about when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait about 10 years ago. Right. And that's why I think that what we really ought to do, if we're really serious about this, yes. we really ought to embark upon a national program to start to get into a solar hydrogen economy. Mm. A solar hydrogen economy would make us less dependent on the most unstable regions of the world. I can't think of a region of the world more unstable than the Middle East. And here we are, our juggler vein. Let me, stop, the let, let me stop you for a second. Uh, a solar hydrogen economy. Tell me uh, as much as you know about how economically feasible, viable, and really clean it would be. Um, in other words, you use solar power to uh, separate and create the hydrogen, which you then store and then people use as fuel. Is there any, is there any hole in that idea anywhere? Well, the only hole is not a technical one. The only hole is economics. Okay. Well, okay. Right. Right now, solar hydrogen is within striking distance of electricity. It's not there yet. We're still talking about prices that are maybe 50 to 70 percent more expensive than that, what you can get from oil and coal. 50 however, to 70 percent. Uh, yeah, however, that's because it has to be jump-started by mass production. Uh, t take a look at nuclear energy. Uh, the only reason why nuclear energy got off the ground is because the U.S. federal government subsidized to the tune of about $100 billion dollars uh, research in reactor safety, the nuclear fuel cycle, and jump-started nuclear. The same thing with solar hydrogen. If you give tax credits and research and you jump-start this technology, uh, then you could begin to create a mass-produced technology which would reduce the cost by about 50 percent and make solar hydrogen competitive with, the, with electricity coming from the Middle East. How do you sell this idea to an oil man? Well, that's the whole trick. Uh, the, the Bush administration, uh, let's face it, George Bush's whole family tree comes out of oil. They oh, are yeah. Texas oil men inside and out. Yeah, well, they bleed, and, they probably bleed the oil and then maybe a little blood. Right. However, it may be forced upon us. In other words, I think that we will go into a solar hydrogen era, not because we want to, but because there's going to be massive instability in the world, which will force us to go to a solar hydrogen economy. The Middle East, like I said, is a tinderbox. It could blow up at any time. You mean you think it's going to get so bad that there's going to be like a cutoff, which they did one time before, something at least that drastic is what you're saying? That they're, they're going to get together and they're going to say the damn warmongering United States, we've had it, no more oil. You think they'd do that? I think there could be massive disruptions in oil, and it could be a real wake-up call when we realize that uh, you know, the feudal monarchies of the Middle East that have been reasonably stable in terms of giving us the oil, yeah. uh, they may begin to listen to the angry voices out there in the mosques. And when that happens, they may decide to turn off that spigot for a while just to see us squirm. And at that point, we're going to say to ourselves, oh, my God, we should really think about the solar hydrogen alternative <laughs> uh, rather than being so dependent on oil from the most unstable region of the world. Okay? All right, well, that, let me just circle back to the question so it doesn't get lost because we're going down a lot of good places, but I, I really do want to get an answer to it, and that is, do you either um, publicly or through private channels know enough so that you would say, are going to war against Saddam Hussein to go in and ostensibly destroy whatever weapons of mass destruction he has, whatever it is we're going to do in Iraq. Uh, is it? Do you know enough that you would say a war is justified? Well, I've been reading everything I can about what's there. Yes. So yes. far, there is unanimous agreement among nuclear experts that Saddam Hussein does not have a nuclear infrastructure. It was pretty much dismantled during the last Gulf War of 91. 
Whether or not he has chemical or biological weapons is much more difficult because, of course, you could put a lot inside a vial of of liquid, and uh, the infrastructure is much smaller. But but you're you're, you're pretty sure there would be a consensus of those who know that there are not yet nuclear weapons there. Yeah, that's pretty much a universal consensus uh, between hawks and doves that he just does not have a nuclear infrastructure because, of course, okay. it would require billions of dollars to maintain this to, to enrich uranium and process plutonium. Okay. Chemical and biological weapons, you get into a gray area, okay? And I personally, to answer your question, I personally am not totally convinced that we have the smoking gun. Yeah. In other words, we don't need a lot of bluster. We need just one solid fact, one mm-hmm. solid fact to convince the man in the street, especially the man in the mosque, Okay, to convince these people that Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein has been uh, cheating his pants off. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And I haven't seen it yet. Now, that doesn't mean that he hasn't been cheating. Okay? God knows he's cheated before. All I'm saying is that I haven't yet seen the smoking gun. Well, then you, and, answer, you answered my question um, exactly the way I answered it for myself. I mean, we just haven't. We haven't had the goods laid on us yet. And I, I don't know how much sports there's going to be for whatever we're going to do if they don't do that. And I, I know maybe it's embarrassing. I mean, maybe we gave them, who knows, some godforsaken bug that will crawl back to kill us. I, 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 maybe we did. But well, I, it, even even if we did, I think we need to come clean. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think uh, scientists as a whole uh, during the Cold War um, did investigate all sorts of hideous designer germs. Uh, they played with smallpox. They played with dengue fever and uh, Rift Valley fever and all sorts of incurable diseases. Did you hear the first lady the other day? Uh, no. Uh, she was on the news uh, that we run here at the top of the hour saying, you know, how, well, you know, I wouldn't uh, hesitate for a second to get my children smallpox vaccinations. And so when the first lady says something like that, that probably means something. Yes, I think we're, we're paying the price in some sense for the excesses of the Cold War. The only place where Saddam Hussein might have gotten some smallpox is from a renegade doctor uh, in the Soviet Union. And I think that's one of the prices we now pay for all the uh, scientific devilry that was cooked up during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, with the Soviet Union breaking apart. Um, a lot of that technology is slowly leaking out. And I think that uh, let's let's hope that uh, we can contain some of these renegade scientists and, and uh, materials from leaking out of the Soviet Union anymore. Do you uh, know anything at all about if we were attacked with smallpox? Um, Professor, do you have any idea how bad it could be? Well, we had. I'm in New York right now. I'm in Manhattan. Right. And uh, we had this outbreak uh, years ago that was contained by a massive, absolutely massive vaccination program that was initiated almost immediately. And it shows that, yes, if you have the will and you have the dollars and you're willing to vaccinate the hundreds of thousands of people almost instantly, yeah. then perhaps you can contain an outbreak. However, if someone were to deliberately uh, in fact, a nation that is unprotected. It in, many, in many places at one time. That's right. I mean, vaccination itself is risky, and uh, there are people who should not get vaccinated, people with uh, medical problems and even eczema, a skin disease. Um, and I think that uh, it's a pretty nasty germ. I mean, look what it did to the Native Americans who were, were not protected, right? Uh, up to 90% of them were wiped out, uh, you know, after Columbus. So I think that it's it's a pretty nasty germ that we're dealing with here. It's one of the biggest killers of humanity. Um, so, in other words, it really could be devastating. I mean, it really could take off in a bunch of places at once if they came after us that way. Well, you know, I mean, put your, you know, if you were Saddam Hussein or if I were Saddam Hussein, right, uh, the thinking is that he probably has sleeper agents around the world. Yep. Uh, to unleash all sorts of, of devilry just to spite the United States and get back at the United States when he's cornered. I mean, a cornered rat will do all sorts of strange things. If did, did, you, uh, gee, did you happen to hear the other day where the United States again uh, reiterated the fact that anybody uses any weapon of mass destruction on us at all, and that's they were referring to that kind of thing exactly, we would not hesitate to use a nuclear weapon. We said that quite loudly uh, a few days ago. That's right. But remember, if Saddam Hussein is going to go down, 
okay? Uh, he may want to take, uh, you know, a few million Americans with him, okay? And I think that, uh, you know, he certainly has the potential if, in fact, he had, he got access to smallpox or got access to mustard gas. So then, then in answer to the question, you're saying that um, an attack, an intentional attack, could cost a few million American lives. few million is what you well, were saying, Well, that's right? the worst-case scenario, okay? That's pretty I mean, bad. As Winston Churchill said, when you go to war, you have to know the, the consequences of the forces that you are unleashing. And Saddam Hussein, if he's cornered, um, well, during the last war, we now know that he did not unleash a lot of the chemical weapons and biological weapons that he had because, of course, that would be the coup de grace, and that would be the end of Saddam Hussein. So he held back. Okay? That's this correct. time, knowing that he's going to die, knowing that he's going to go down, he's not going to hold back. Okay? And we have to understand the consequences of this. Uh, both politically, you know, in terms of the stability of Pakistan and Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia, but also militarily in terms of uh, the fact that this corner dictator could at least a lot of stuff uh, if he knows that he's going to go down too. What we would, have to be what, prepared for that. What would you do? Well, like I said, I would... Well, yeah, I know about the alternative. Right, it's energy, the bigger but... picture. Oil, it also, you know, the United Nations, you know, it's kind of a joke, the United Nations. <laughs> it's a there dance. So it's many a... resolutions. Oh, it's a, it's a big dance if, we're going through. If the United Nations had been strengthened in the last 10 years, these resolutions would not be laughed at by Saddam Hussein. They'd be taken seriously. But unfortunately, I think we've sort of let the United Nations atrophy. It's issued all these proclamations saying that Saddam Hussein should disarm. He's laughed at us. Okay, and now we find ourselves in big doo-doo. So I think we're paying the price for allowing the United Nations to atrophy because now we're trying to prop it up. All right, uh, Professor, uh, hold it right there. We're at the bottom of the hour. We've let the U.N. atrophy, huh? Now we're paying the price. I'm Art Bell from the high desert. This is Coast to Coast AM. You're listening to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring a replay of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. Somewhere in Time, tonight featuring a replay of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. War, nearly certain war, that's uh, certainly something that will put you on the ground to think about it for a little while, huh? War is coming, definitely days, probably weeks, but really, really soon. It's on the way. On December 15th, um, CNN reported a large uh, triangular object hovering over Baghdad, I am told. Now, uh, that's very interesting. Isn't that interesting? Uh, in fact, I actually managed to get a camera shot, I understand, of something triangular hovering over Baghdad. Not to be confused with the green tracers that were fired at it, but, you know, something, somebody saw something just hovering, described as looking like the Phoenix Lights. Over Baghdad. I thought that was pretty interesting stuff. you got to wonder about the kind of craft we have. I, I don't wonder. I, I saw one of these things close up myself. You know, it either was divine gravity or, well, I don't know. I saw one of them out here, though, and, and uh, they, they put something over Baghdad. I mean, is there very it, it, little is there a little question in your mind, Professor, that, that war, in fact, war is coming? Well, I think all the indications are that the Bush administration wants regime change, as they say, as the, the foundation of their foreign policy. Yeah. And uh, it does look like uh, you know, George Bush is hell-bent on war. Yeah, regardless of the outcome of the U.N. inspections, I think he's gearing up the U.S. military for war. Yeah. Um, how much do you know about the high-tech toys that we have or probably have, Professor, that we could bring into play uh, if the inevitable occurs? Well, the, the biggest change between now and what happened in 91 uh, is the fact that our munitions, rather cheaply, uh, $20,000 apiece, can be outfitted with GPS positioning devices. Uh, back in 91, things were done by lasers, 
and if it was smoky or it was foggy, mm-hmm. um, the cloud cover would disperse the laser beam. Uh, lasers don't go very well through fog. Right. However, uh, radio does, and GPS systems uh, can, can lock onto satellites. And these GPS devices are very cheap. Uh, they only cost about $20,000. And you could take a dumb bomb and, quote, make them smart uh, by inserting one of these portable GPS positioning devices on them. And uh, so about uh, 10% of our munitions dropped during the Gulf War were uh, smart and 90% were dumb. In this war, it could be the, it could be the reverse. Uh, it could be that most of the munitions will be smart, uh, that is GPS-guided. But I think that, uh, well, there could be potential danger there. We could begin to believe that our weapons are so smart that they work all the time. And, of course, that's not true. We see, we see bombs falling into uh, schoolyards and uh, hospitals all the time. And even if that doesn't happen, tonight's headlines say Saddam is prepared to crank out how casualties destroy his own infrastructure. Actually, the scorched land policy, have you heard about that? Yeah. yeah. Again, put yourself in his position. If he's a cornered rat and he knows he's going to go down with the ship, he wants to take as many uh, of us as, as he possibly can to make his mark on, on the history books. Uh, I think he's sort of resigned himself now that he's going to go down. And if so, he wants to take as many Americans with him as he possibly can. So how do you feel about living in New York? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I live not that far from the uh, World Trade Center. Yeah. And uh, it was, of course, uh, rather shocking when the whole thing happened and sort of makes you feel uh, vulnerable. Well, in, two in, great oceans protecting yeah, us for so in, many in generations. The, in, in the case, though, of these bugs that might get released, and you know damn well New York, Washington, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, um, and then on down the list from there, I suppose. Um, you can be like New York is going to be like first. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the prices of living in uh, the great metropolitan center of New York City, and that is that there's a, you know, it's one of the most densely populated areas of the entire country. Eight million people uh, lie within uh, the boundaries of uh, New York City. And uh, even if you chop up Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn would be, uh, I think, America's second largest city if you just chop up New York City. So I think we have a well, tremendous... That's what I think he has in mind, chopping well, up New York City. And, yeah, I and, think that's something that we have to come to grips with, and we have to say to ourselves, is it worth it? You know, I mean, uh, the instability in the Middle East, not to mention the instability in our own cities, if uh, something like this happens. Well, maybe it's worth it. I just, you know, I haven't, I feel like I haven't been given enough information yet to make that judgment about whether it's worth it or not. Uh, it, I mean, for sure, if we knew we, he had some awful thing and he absolutely had the will, in fact, the intention to let loose on it, then by all means, kick his butt first. But I don't think we're anywhere close to that standard of proof yet, or at least not publicly. Right. And I also think, you know, going back to the United Nations, our favorite whipping boy, right, mm-hmm. uh, this is going to happen again and again and again. Okay, now Iran apparently is building nuclear weapons. That yes, was so I've the, heard. the wire service was just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Look at North Korea. Yeah. We're going to be going through the same song and dance over and over and over again. Didn't we always know that was coming? Right. I mean, proliferation, we knew that, right? That's right. And again, this is one of the prices we paid for the Cold War when we allowed these this technology to escape because it would, they would be anti-communist weapons. And now we see that they're falling into all sorts of different kinds of hands. Uh, for example, North Korea, we now know, got most of its uranium technology from Pakistan. And Pakistan, in turn, was allowed to get this technology because Pakistan was against the, uh, the, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan uh, during the Reagan years. And so a lot of nuclear technology flowed into Pakistan during the 80s under Ronald Reagan, which now is flowed into North Korea, okay, you know, all in the, the name of anti-communism. The big problem is that today's friend uh, almost always turns out to be tomorrow's enemy. I mean, it just happens again and again and again. So if we allow some country for political reason, because we're friendly, to get weapons n- now or did then, well, then it may well be that in a few years they won't like us. Well, that's what happened. You know, we armed the Afghan rebels. You know that, right? A billion dollars went to the Afghan rebels. All those shoulder-fire missiles and everything, sure. That's where they got their stingers. Stingers can take out an airline, a commercial uh, airline. That's what a stinger missile can do. And you know we're worried about that right now uh, because, of course, uh, they they, they shot at one and uh, they missed, but... uh, uh, those missiles are well, out there. They're definitely out there. You know, our, our biggest enemy is U.S.-made weapons, okay?
Okay, U.S. made weapons that fell into the hands of the Taliban because we gave it to them uh, during the uh, uh, Afghan war. Well, aren't we the, like the biggest producer of, uh, you know, big guns? Yes, yeah, right, and that's why we have to worry about what happens when our own weapons eventually fall into the hands of terrorists. Uh, that's why during the Afghan war just last year, that's why our jets had to fly so high. You could barely see them up there. Yeah. And the reason is they were fearful of U.S.-made Stinger missiles taking them out. Okay? And I think this is a, a, a tragedy that's not told to the American people, that our own military is absolutely frightened of, of U.S.-made weapons like Stingers. Well, we, we make good weapons, so we should be frightened of them. But, I mean, I, I guess we've got to, like, stay a few generations ahead of what, gets leaked out to them. That's a crazy world, but that's the, about the truth of it, isn't it? Yes, but we have to realize now we're pushing nuclear. Now we're pushing the fact that Pakistan got the bomb mainly because we essentially allowed them to get the bomb, and right. then Pakistan sold it to North Korea. Oh, right. It's no surprise that North Korea has, has is, is looking at uranium enrichment technology because it came from, indirectly, the United States. Yeah, and, 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 and we really knew that North Korea was proceeding with a bomb. Our CIA damn well knew what they were doing. They had to know. If they didn't know, then they were deficient. So, and, and so that's why I say that instead of the UN issuing this, these toothless uh, proclamations that are useless and a laughing stock of the world, well, it dance. should be built up because we're going to have to face Iran, we're going to have to face North Korea, we're going to have to face God knows how many countries that want to beat their chest and say that they have the the next bomb because are their their mortal enemy on the other side of the border has the bomb. Yeah. And uh, this is the price we're going to pay unless we begin to strengthen the United Nations and diplomacy and negotiations, or else we're going to have to take on all these small nations aspiring to become the next uh, superpower in their region. Do you think that we're past the danger of uh, nuclear annihilation? We haven't talked about that in, you know, a lot of years. I mean, ever since the fearful hide under the desk when, when I was a kid, you know, cover up, duck and cover, and all the rest of that. I mean, ever since then, we haven't really talked about that because, you know, we assumed when the wall fell, so did the danger. But, but yes, it, but I think there are two dangers. One is accidental war because, uh, of course, all these nuclear weapons, they more or less still exist. The, the so-called dismantled weapons can be remantled almost any time. Remantled. Uh. And they, they, did, they basically disassembled them. They unscrewed the cap, uh -huh. and they took the nuclear pit out, as they call it, However, they can put the pit back in within a matter of seconds and reassemble these things. So I think that instead of getting rid of the plutonium, we simply stockpile the plutonium uh, for what God knows. And I think it means that we still have uh, several hundred tons worth yeah. of the deadliest material plutonium lying around. Well, how likely is the scenario, I'm sure this has been kicked around plenty, uh, that if there are, if there would be a nuke or two or four or ten used, uh, India, Pakistan, whatever started it, that then it would be a sort of a, a join hands thing and people would align and take sides and other bombs would start to go off and before you know it, uh, oh gosh, before you know it, uh, we're back to that scenario, that nuclear annihilation scenario, is that possible from something like this? It's possible things could escalate. Let's say China gets involved, uh, of oh, course, sure. because China is India's big rival, yeah. okay? Yeah. And all of a sudden we're talking about big powers suddenly being sucked into something yes. and, and uh, taking sides. Uh, look at World War I. Uh, World War I started with the assassination of an obscure Archduke of Yugoslavia, for God's sake. Yeah. And it touched off one thing, touched off another, ricocheted across the corridors of power. And all of a sudden, the entire world was engulfed in uh, World War I. And I think with so many loose nukes around and with the nuclear weapons proliferating into the most dangerous areas of the world, like between India, Pakistan, and the Middle East, I think uh, it's not going to be a very pleasant place to be. How many nuclear weapons? Um, I've always kind of wondered about this, just sort of a civilian question here, but how many nuclear weapons would it take to go off uh, to have a really nasty effect on more or less the whole planet? Well, uh, Carl Sagan did an estimate of this, and they estimated that as little as 100 megatons, okay, which is just nothing but a handful of nuclear weapons, 100 megatons. Uh, uh, would be the, the lowest number uh, necessary to set off a nuclear winter. Uh, other calculations perhaps put it a little higher. However, at the height of the Cold War, each superpower had about 30,000 30, atomic and hydrogen bombs in their arsenal. 
uh, many times, thousands of times, the number necessary to to set off a nuclear winter and block the sun, and and we would go the way of the dinosaurs. What is the biggest bomb we have? Do you know? Uh, about 20 megatons. At the height of the Cold War, the, the Russians detonated an 80 megaton bomb. 80. 80. Yeah, they claimed it was 100, but it's been recently recalibrated down to about. 80 megatons. That was the biggest bomb ever detonated in the history of, of the world. That sure is a big bomb. That's a huge bomb. It created tremendous amounts of fallout. It was logged on all the seismographs around the country. It really scared the hell out of a lot of people when that big bomb was detonated. Uh, our bombs tend to be smaller, less than 20 megatons. 20 megatons is the largest of the bombs. And again, that in turn is uh, a thousand times bigger than the Hiroshima bomb, which was only 20 kilotons worth of TNT. Yeah. Oh, These gee. are pretty powerful weapons. And again, with the Soviet Union falling apart, uh, who knows whether one of these things will eventually wind up on the black market. It only takes one, you know, to create uh, international panic. And uh, the Russians have thousands of these things that they can barely account for. That they can barely account for. Yeah, their um, their monitoring system is very deficient. All sorts of reports have stated that they're loosely guarded. And uh, the Russians, of course, as a matter of national pride, keep saying that they can keep track of these damn things. Uh, but it only takes one to fall through the cracks. you know. And uh, these things are, are very powerful weapons, enough to wipe out the greater New York metropolitan area from Connecticut all the way down to New Jersey. They can wipe out the tri-state area here. Just one nuclear weapon of that one, size. One bomb of that size. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, well, I mean, everybody should at least bear in mind, shouldn't they, that if we begin a war, which seems a sure thing now, that it always has at least a, a potential, perhaps albeit hopefully a small one, of ending up that way. Well, it's hope so, but like I said, if, if Egypt falls or Jordan is destabilized or, or God forbid, if Pakistan uh, has a regime change, uh, we're in big trouble, okay? Um, like I said before, you know, these terrorists, uh, they see suicide as part of national policy, That's okay. okay? Yes. And if uh, Pakistan's 20 or so nuclear weapons were to land in the hands of fundamentalists, that would change the entire equation. I mean, think about this. Uh, mullahs, uh, you know, fundamentalist uh, mullahs that hate the United States in charge of up to 20 atomic bombs, that really gives one pause. Oh, it does. And the government there is not that stable, as you know. It's just barely hanging on with its fingernails. Uh, and there's no way you can think right now that um, a charging into Iraq, a full bore, which we're getting ready to do, is justified by what we know so far about what, what might or might not be there because it could absolutely result in more harm than uh, than safety for the world. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. Well, we could be the bull in the china shop, you know, with a very delicate balance of uh, power in the Middle East, and God knows where all the chinaware is going to fall if, if, if the bull starts some kind of, uh, you know, big war in the area. Uh, if you look at the last uh, Persian Gulf War, uh, the big victor of that war was, in some sense, not the United States, because, of course, Saddam Hussein survived. The big victor in that war was uh, Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, that's where Islamic fundamentalism got its big start, was in the 1991 uh, war, a war fought in the backyard of these fundamentalists. And that was the, their big shot in the arm when that war took place. And so war, the winners of war are often you know, not who you think they are. Uh, World War One and Two were fought between the Great German Empire and the Great British Empire, but who won those wars was not either Britain or Germany, but it was the United States and Russia. Okay, so the people who win these wars sometimes are totally different than the people who started these wars, and I think the big winner of the last uh, Persian Gulf War was not the United States at all. The winner was Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, well, it certainly has blossomed since then. There's no uh, denying that. I mean, yeah, all this talk would have been unimaginable in 1990. Can you imagine this kind of talk happening in 1990 when Jordan, yeah, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan were deemed stable? No one even considered these possibilities. Now it's after the Persian Gulf War, and look at how Islamic fundamentalism has grown. And again, the victors of war are often not who you think they're going to be. Okay. And the United States, in some sense, did not win the 1991 uh, Persian Gulf War because Saddam Hussein is still in power. 
And, in fact, it helped to unleash the current wave of anger against the United States. If we go sweeping into Iraq and come back with the head of Saddam Hussein on a silver platter, or, well, it's, or, it's, equi- or, it's, or it's equivalent, we will, we, will we have won? See, we know we can do it. I know. Okay? I, I, I'm saying, will we have won? Well, I think we'll win the battle, but we may lose the war. How okay? do you imagine we would lose this next war? Well, I think um, you know, every general fights the last war, okay? Yeah, well, of But course. I think, you know, we have to look at the next war afterwards, okay? And unless we begin to put a lid on all these weapons of mass destruction through negotiation, we're going to have to put a lid on these weapons of mass negotiations through war. Okay. Well, they and lie. Again, I mean, everybody, but everybody lies about it, of course. You know, proliferation and research and development, they all lie. Like I said, Iran is next. Are we willing to take on Iran? Okay. They're beginning to develop these weapons. And what I'm saying is, if these U.N. proclamations meant something, for God's sake, okay, if the international body politic, nations upon nations were to say, yes, let's believe in these resolutions and make them have teeth, rather than being these teeth- teethless Huh. resolutions, yeah. then perhaps we wouldn't try to uh, curry the favor of the United Nations when we need it. But that means the U.N. has to have teeth, and the members of the U.N. are chamberlains. They're, they don't have teeth. Well, I think we've allowed it to atrophy in that direction. I think we sort of like washed our hands of it. Uh, we think that it's anti-U.S., and therefore we don't need it. And then when we need it, then when we, we want to have this grand coalition... Okay, then we realize how much it is decayed. Okay, see, George Bush needs the United Nations because so many people say that we need to have international consensus. Oh, he needs a rubber stamp from the. Well, he needs a rubber stamp, but see that rubber stamp. Professor, hold on, we'll we'll pick up on this when we get back from the high desert. I'm Art Bell. You're listening to Art Bell somewhere in time on Premier Radio Networks tonight. An encore presentation of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. So long. Listen to the strange stories. You're listening to Ark Bell Somewhere in Time on Premier Radio Networks. Tonight, an encore presentation of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. Well, now, with uh, regard to war. You've had uh, uh, quite a number of uh, opinions laid upon you. Uh, That would be the opinion of several of you out there, and then one of the greatest minds in our country about war. So there you are, uh, plenty to think about, uh, far from the majority, certainly, on this issue, but at least uh, uh, he certainly answered the question. Professor Michio Kaku is my guest, and he'll be right back. As all of this is to segue from, uh, I wanted to get the answer to that question from the professor, and I feel like I definitely got it. Now on to some more interesting things in in many ways. Um, as a suggestion for the show, uh, the professor said, you know, we might discuss some of the Christmas movies, you know, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Star Trek, and so forth, whether civilizations in space might be able to master these technologies, you know, as exemplified in these movies. And so we have a number of them here, and I'm not necessarily going to take them uh, in order. Now, I I said there was just a big sighting. In fact, CNN had it of a triangular craft above, above Baghdad, just like the one that was above Phoenix. Now, let's ask about levitation of machines, uh, the ability of something to seemingly defy gravity. Oh, in fact, let's even start there. Professor, I have the hardest, hardest time, and I still don't understand what the hell gravity is. Gravity holds us here. It gives us weight. It makes things drop onto the table when we drop them. But I just, I don't, I've never properly understood what gravity really is. Is it because 
the Earth has mass, and so we're pulled to it? Is that gravity, or what's gravity? Well, Newton thought that gravity pulled. It was a force that pulled you to the floor, but, of course, that leaves open the question, what is force? Einstein introduced perhaps the most realistic scenario, Yes. and he said that uh, gravity doesn't pull, uh, space pushes, okay? No. So if I have a bed sheet and I put a ball, a very heavy rock, let's say, on a bed sheet, everything, of course, sinks into the rock on the bed sheet. And if I then hurl a marble, a tiny marble, around this rock, the marble will orbit. And there are two ways you can look at it. You could either say that the rock pulls on the marble, but that's not what's really happening at all. No, well, no. What happened is the rock is making an indentation, so the marble is slowly circling toward and will eventually hit the rock, right? That's right. So, in other words, the bed sheet is pushing on the marble. Not well, that gravity pulls, but the bed sheet pushes on the marble, deflecting it into the path of a circle. Okay? Yeah. So, let's say I have a crumpled sheet of paper and put little ants on a crumpled sheet of paper. You guys always use ants. Right. Well, yeah. that's because we think that we are the ants. Well, the ants would say that it's impossible to walk in a straight line on a crumpled sheet of paper because there are forces, invisible forces, uh, pulling you to the left, pulling you to the right. Now, we know there's no pull at all. It's just the, the crumpled sheet of paper that pushes, pushes the ant to the left, pushes the ant to the right. Now, this crumpled sheet of paper is space. Space is invisible. That's why we can't see this force of gravity, but it's caused by the curvature of space-time. So believe it or not, the reason why you're sitting in your chair in your living room is not because gravity pulls you to the floor, but because the Earth has warped the space around you, and the space around you pushes you down to the floor, okay? Are you sure about that? Well, we I mean, are, have... you sh are you sure that's what gravity is? Right. Well, we now have satellites that have tested Einstein's general theory of relativity to within experimental error, 1%. Now, remember, back in the 1920s when Einstein's theory was first verified, there were a lot of error bars, and people could still quibble about whether Einstein was really right or wrong with the deflection of sunlight. So then is it the mass of the Earth that is um, bending or deflecting the space that's providing the pressure? Because obviously gravity is related to the Earth, because when you're not on it, you don't have gravity. That's right. The more right? Earth, the greater curvature. So it is right. directly proportional and, and can be measured by the mass, the amount of mass of whatever. That's right. right. And, of course, for small gravitational fields, this approximates Newton's old theory. But for black holes, okay, we see that Newton's theory has to be thrown out the window. Uh, for black holes, we really do see that spinning black holes behave as if you have a spinning bed sheet. If you have a spinning bed sheet with a depression inside, it looks as if you have, like, molasses being dragged around the black hole, right, around the bed sheet. We see this now. We actually have photographed this with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can actually see space, like molasses, being whipped around by the black hole, eating up star systems and, and, and uh, clouds of, of stellar material. You can actually see what is called frame dragging. And, again, for a low gravitational field, it's really hard to see the difference between Newton's theory and Einstein's theory. You need stars before you can see the difference. But with black holes, it's the right, it stares at you in the face. You can really see that space-time looks like molasses. That's, that's being churned around by a spinning black hole. And we photographed this now with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we now have visual confirmation of Einstein's theory, not just experiments with satellites and, and laser beams, but okay. visually you can see it. All right. If we, if we absolutely then understand what the force gravity is, wouldn't that be the first step in, um, uh, def well, I, don't, I don't know if I want to say defying it, uh, but the first step in, yeah, eventually, um, uh, defying it or finding a way to neutralize it, or in other words, coming up with something that will float. Well, you're talking about anti-gravity, right? Yes, probably anti-gravity or some uh, understanding of the force that is gravity that will, would allow us to circumnavigate it or to manage it or to use it as a propulsive device, or you get the idea. Yeah, well, anti-gravity is very, very difficult because you have to have a, a negative matter. And we've never seen negative matter. Negative matter would fall up. It wouldn't fall down. 
Uh, we've looked at, uh, we've looked for negative matter in the oceans, in the air, in outer space. We see no evidence of it. We've never seen a bit, even a tiny little negative matter. No, if anything. there was negative matter in the Earth, this is not antimatter, by the way. Antimatter, we think, falls down. Okay, antimatter is positive energy; it falls down. Negative matter, okay, in in it was different from antimatter, would actually fall up. If there was negative matter when the Earth was very young, it would have fallen up billions of years ago, and would be in outer space, almost by definition. So we even, even, even deep within the bowels of the Earth, there wouldn't be... We looked at the bottom of the oceans for exotic kinds of particles like negative matter. Now, recently, we've gotten a lot of interest in negative matter because negative matter can be used to drive a time machine. Okay, All the recent work uh, of the last the decade or so in time machines uh, is because we think that negative matter is so exotic, so bizarre, that you can actually use it as a gasoline for time machines. Okay, Boy, now, you're singing my song now. Right now, we've never seen negative matter, and it may be in outer space. One day, an astronaut may what, come by negative matter, what, but we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, what would the nature of, uh, as we understand physics, what would the nature of negative matter be other than the fact that it would fall up, you said? I understand. I can grasp that. It would fall up. Well, we have a good grasp of antimatter because antimatter is ordinary positive matter with a negative charge, I mean reverse charge, so a proton would have negative charge. Now, anti, I mean negative ne matter negative is totally matter. different. Right. Negative matter has negative mass, okay, and, which is different from antimatter, which falls down. Negative now, mass. It, now, it, we don't know less, anything about it. That means it's less than a thing. It's that's, not, right? That's right. Okay. Now, well, negative right. energy, on the other hand, we have duplicated in the laboratory. This is the famous Casimir effect. Uh, we have actually duplicated negative energy in the laboratory. Uh, some people have claimed that you can use that for a time machine, but it would be very, very feeble time machine. You wouldn't be able to teleport anything more than a tiny subatomic particle backwards in time. But the Casimir effect uh, already exists, measured in the laboratory several decades ago, in fact. It's very tiny, but it gives you negative energy. If you had negative matter, you can manipulate it, and you could then begin to warp space and time so that this molasses that I talked about, right, would actually bend on itself, and you would get uh, wormholes opening up. Okay, so negative matter almost immediately opens up a wormhole in space and time. If you could get your hands, I'll have to use this, I suppose, metaphorically, on negative matter, how would you contain it? Well, you see, with... Antimatter, that's a problem, because antimatter annihilates with ordinary matter, right. and you would blow yourself to smithereens. That's, that's right? what I was wondering, yeah. Now, negative matter, we don't know too much about it. We just plug this into Einstein's equations, and all of a sudden a space warp, and in fact a wormhole opens up whenever you put a, a piece of negative matter into Einstein's equations. So um, think of the molasses again, or our bed sheet. All of a sudden you have two regions of the bed sheet connected by, by, a, by a tunnel, and that tunnel would be then uh, held open, held open by negative matter. Uh, we don't know anything about it. It would be subatomic matter. Would, uh, would it be potentially containable in any way you can even imagine? Well, it's too early to speculate because we have no theory of negative matter other than just putting it into Einstein's equations. Uh, if you put it into Einstein's equations, all of a sudden magic happens and all of a sudden the bed sheet twists and turns and, and <laughs> bends on itself. Uh, this has been well known for, for decades, but only within the last decade has been a lot of research because, of course, these wormholes would be time machines. Well, if, if for example, um, our astronauts in the International Space Station were to encounter negative matter, which I suppose is more possible there than it is here on Earth since all ours has already fallen up, mm -hmm. it probably wouldn't be a very, or possibly at least, wouldn't be an agreeable meeting, would it? Yes, it wouldn't be too agreeable because if you got too close to it, uh, you may not be able to get uh, back very quickly. You may wind up in a different time era. Uh, the negative matter opens up what are called transversible wormholes. Now, let me explain. An ordinary black hole also opens up a wormhole, but it's a one-way ticket. <laughs> it's a one-way trip through the black hole, and you never come back. The black hole has an event horizon. Negative matter does not have an event horizon. It, there's no point of no return. They are transversible. You can go back and forth, back and forth really? between them. Really? That's why they've engendered so much interest ever since the group at Caltech uh, showed, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, the first solutions using negative energy and negative matter, showing that they would create wormholes that are quite nice. 
uh, transversible, reversible. You can go back and forth and uh, come back. After well, gee, this is the first I've heard of this. I mean, normally you have said that uh, time travel would require such immense amounts of energy, perhaps the management of the energy of the sun or better. Then we couldn't do it, but if we were to get our hands on some negative matter, uh, all of a sudden we've got a swinging door. Right. However, that's the trick, though. We've never seen it in the laboratory. We've looked for it. It would be fantastic. Uh, it would, of course, have tremendous amounts of uh, potential for, for practical use. Um, and at the present time, I think most physicists have given up looking on the Earth. Uh, we would have to look into outer space and uh -huh. hope that some astronaut could find it, but it's not for us. Uh, we don't find any on planet Earth. Everything on the Earth falls down. Okay? Every experiment. Is there much evidence that uh, there would be negative matter even in space? Um, I, I suppose negative matter could be eternally traveling from one uh, uh, magnetic influence to another or bouncing off them, whatever it is it would do, uh, right? Yeah, it's conceivable. Um, again, no one's ever seen any, so we can't make any experiments. And uh, negative matter, but by the way, would not fit into the so-called quark model of today. So we would have to modify the quark model, but it's uh, a, a term that easily fits with Einstein's equations. If negative matter were out there, let's say there was a ball of negative matter out there, and it was traveling along, uh, would we observe anything about space um, or the space it was traversing uh, that would give it away? Well, let's say the negative matter was spinning in a ring, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then a wormhole would open up, and if you fell through the ring, you may wind up in a different piece of space and time. No, but I mean, uh, our astronomers, I mean, would there be anything about space? Uh, would negative matter be invisible in all probability? Uh, would it be disturbing space to a degree that somebody could notice that anomaly with a telescope, would we know? Well, it would warp gravity in a highly unorthodox way. Like if you, but it would take probably a large chunk of, of negative matter before it became uh, optically uh, visible. That is, starlight would bend around such an object in a bizarre way. Okay? All right. And then you can start to infer that there's something out there. Now, this is how, by the way, we detect dark matter. Uh, dark matter is ordinary matter, but it's invisible, and it makes up most of the universe. We know that dark matter is out there because the Hubble Space Telescope has seen light deflected, light deflected around galaxies as if galaxies were surrounded by dark matter. And so here we have something that's actually invisible, dark matter, which makes up 90% of the matter of the universe, bending starlight, and we now use that to create maps of dark matter uh, which surround different galaxies. Are you suggesting to me that dark matter would be, would create a stable portal, theoretically, a stable portal in which to um, uh, to go forward or to go back in time? Yeah, negative and, matter, right. Yeah, dark matter, we think, is ordinary matter no, in negative a matter. form. Negative matter would, would allow this portal near its presence um, to go forward or reverse um, in time? That's right. Uh, the group wow. at Caltech uh, ex were experimenting uh, in their minds, of course, with theory, uh, saying that if I had a little bit of negative energy, yes. okay, which, of course, already exists, we could open up a wormhole, but the size of that wormhole would be less than that of a subatomic particle. So it's kind of a useless device because it's a time machine, but only if you're smaller than a subatomic particle. But I take it it's like a firecracker, the energy as compared to the matter. Negative. Yeah, but negative matter would be stable, okay, and you'd have to have, again, large quantities of it. But in principle, it would open up wormholes, and the larger the wormhole, the larger the amount of matter necessary to stabilize the wormhole. Okay? And that would then connect two regions of space-time. Anytime you have negative matter, it opens up a wormhole. Uh, Frank Tipler once showed that several decades ago. Uh, but now, of course, we're looking for these things, and we have theories of time machines that uh, have been proposed. And a quick and dirty way of doing it is to find this already existing in outer space rather than having to create the energy of a star on the Earth. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, however, I should point out, once again, we've never seen it. Uh, you have to put it into Einstein's equations, and then it, it opens up a wormhole. But so far, uh, we, no one has ever bagged such an animal yet. And uh, maybe the space program will one of these days. Yes, indeed. We're, we're looking. Uh, you, you admit then we're looking. And if we saw something that we thought was it, we would try and grab it. 
Right. Well, yeah, the way to do it is to look for deflection of starlight. Right. Uh, that's how we, we find the existence of, of passing black holes and dark matter, by looking at the distortion of starlight as measured by telescopes and the Hubble. Uh, Suppose some authorities uh, came to you and said, oh, my God, um, uh, Dr. Kaku, we have found a region or a small segment of uh, dark matter, and we're going to uh, take a spacecraft to try and retrieve it. Um, how, and, and they asked you for advice on, on how you would um, uh, uh, get and uh, bring back this dark matter. And negative matter, right. Uh, negative uh, matter, I'm sorry. The way to do it is to send space probes. Uh, we would have to send instruments. Because Robots. Potentially, Robots. this is dangerous. Uh, you were talking about uh, gravitational effects that we've never seen before That's in right. a laboratory. Uh, negative matter, like I said, falls up. It repels ordinary matter. Well, and so, um, Professor, hold it right there. Hold it right there. We're, we're at the bottom of the hour. We'll pick up a very, very interesting negative matter. If it was whizzing along up there, we'd send a robot to go get it. But then if it was going to fall up, how could we bring it down? <laughs> That's exactly what we'll ask when we get back. That is absolutely fascinating stuff. A time machine. Coming and going. All we need is a little bit of negative matter. You're listening to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring a replay of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. Radio Networks presents Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight's program originally aired December 18th, 2002. Isn't this something? After all the talk we've had on uh, the near impossibility of time travel, uh, because of the obstacles we'd have to overcome power-wise, we now learn something called negative matter would allow a stable portal back and forth. It would be a time machine. Negative matter is just a matter of finding some negative matter which might be in space. And my question still stands uh, with a good professor, and that is if he was uh, consulted on how to go get it and contain it and then bring it back home, what suggestions, I wonder, would he have? in a science fiction novel, all of a sudden, scientists find, through whatever spacecraft we have monitoring such things, that there is some negative matter traversing an area between, say, our moon and the Earth, an eminently available kind of area, you know, so we could get a robot uh, a spacecraft up there and scoop up some of this negative matter, or at least have the opportunity to do so. If they were to come to you and say, well, Professor... What do we do? I mean, do we do we scurry it into a lead box? Do we have electromagnetic force fields holding it in place? Do we? What would you suggest we do with the negative matter? I mean, we get it, then what? Well, because it is repulsive uh, with respect to ordinary matter, yeah. uh, all we have to do is put a net around it. The net would repel the negative matter, but if the net were symmetrical, okay, it would repel negative matter evenly. And you could trap negative matter with an ordinary net, okay? An ordinary net. Right. You can't do that with antimatter, because if the net were to touch antimatter, it would explode. Right. But you see, negative matter, by definition, is repulsive under gravity. Yes. So a net uh, around it would uh, repel the negative matter evenly. You could scoop it up like a butterfly. That's right. And, um, however, like I said before, we've never seen any. We don't know its properties. We would have to send probes into it to, to test its nature because it could be quite dangerous, and it could warp space and time in totally unpredicted ways. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of caution would be uh, preserved if, yeah. if at some point in the future we ever got one of these damn things. Would you recommend that it be put in orbit? instead of uh, attempting to bring it home right away? Well, I think it should be kept at a good, safe distance from the Earth um, because we don't know its basic properties. 
Um, we know that uh, planets are held together by gravity. Gravity pulls evenly. And that, by the way, is the reason why the Earth is round. Perhaps then you'd recommend that it would be landed softly, if possible, on the moon. Uh, possibly, or simply kept in outer space, because it is repulsive. It would not want to land on the moon. It would want to be in outer space. Mm. And we would, of course, want to see whether we could machine it. Okay? And the ideal configuration might be a ring, uh, in which case... A ring. Um, a ring, in which case, <laughs> if you go through the bullseye of the ring, <laughs> uh, you may find yourself uh, on a different piece of space and time than when you first started. A okay? different... Oh, no, that's interesting. Not just a different time, but a different space as well? In other words, uh, if I theoretically went through this ring, Professor, mm -hmm. I wouldn't just be, I don't know, back or forward a few years or many years, but I would actually be in a different place as well? That's right. You would be distorted both in displaced, both in space and time simultaneously if you were to go through a, a wormhole or what we, what we physicists call a multiply connected space. Right. Uh, uh, think of sheets of paper that are parallel that are joined at different spots. And uh, these two sheets of paper may exist uh, in parallel with each other, except once in a while they intersect. Would I live through it? Well, if you have a large enough, a massive enough object uh, with a large enough uh, wormhole, then you may be able to walk through it, yeah. Uh, we've, we've calculated the tidal forces when you walk through one of these things. It's possible that if you have enough of this matter, you could walk through it and not feel anything more than simply being on an airline's, an airline's flight uh, through one of these things. <laughs> um, what do you imagine that I might step into on the other side? Well, it depends on how you solve Einstein's equations. Einstein's equations do allow for space to be bent back in on itself. Mm -hmm. And, of course, before we walk into one of these things, we should calculate the geometry of it and estimate to our best degree of accuracy what's on the other side. Send a cat or two through it. Right. Okay. And then send but, but, a probe but, I mean, through it. But, but let's, let's uh, a probe, okay. It would be probe, transversible. So the probe could come back. And send photographs, And pictures. send photographs, right. Yeah. Uh, what do you imagine, Professor, that we might see in those photographs? I mean, would we see our own world at a different time? Would we see a different world? Would it be a different dimension with different, a different race of people walking around? What, what are the possibilities? It could just be our own universe uh, displaced uh, dramatically in space and time, uh, a wormhole that simply connects our own universe uh, with itself. Okay? Which would That's mean? Uh, which would mean it's a gateway to the future or a gateway to the past. Okay? And, of course, that then g gives us the question as to what happens when you shoot your parents before y yes. you're born. Yes. Uh, then you would have a time paradox. Which you have really always answered by suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, we live in a bubble and, and essentially another bubble would be created if you killed your grandfather and there would be then two uh, infinitely continuing timelines that would, right. would break off. Is that the only possible answer to that? Well, the, the simplest resolution to all these paradoxes is to have uh, the timeline fork. Uh, the river of time would fork into two rivers, and uh, two universes would open up, and there'd be no contradictions whatsoever. You, you could alter your past, but in some sense it's somebody else's past, uh, somebody else who looks genetically the same as you. You've altered his past. But your own past is fixed. You cannot really change your own past. You is, have to disappear. Is this an answer we've come up with simply because of the impossibility of any other answer? <laughs> uh, well, the other possibility is that you fulfill the past. But that's kind of boring because then it was such that you were destined to go back in time to complete the circle. Right. So it was, it was written. It was destined that you would then go back in time. Huh. And that, then, of course, that leaves the question of free will. What happens if you don't feel like going backwards in time and fulfilling your destiny, uh, you know, back in time some, at some point? So, you know, some people have said that maybe great conquerors or, or scientists were actually time travelers from the future. Uh, but then, of course, that raises the question, you know, uh, what happens if they alter their own past? Uh, could they not then make themselves vanish because their own past was impossible? Could they just accidentally kill their ancestor before they were born. Is there anything that would happen potentially to the traveler? In other words, if Dr. Kaku stepped through 
would his memories of the past and where he had been versus where he is now be intact, or would he simply be part of a new uh, reality in every way, including uh, mentally, just step into what you would feel has always been there? Well, I would disagree <laughs> with the science fiction writers who say that your memory is going to change and your whole being is going to change uh, if you create what is called a time quake, that is, go backwards in time uh -huh. and create a time paradox which then ripples back on you into the future, right? Yes. I think a much simpler solution to the problem is that time forks. Time simply forks into two rivers, and then you don't have any paradoxes. Uh, the quantum theory has within it uh, the ability to bifurcate universes, and if the universe splits off, uh, then basically you've altered somebody else's path. But what I'm saying is, would you be aware that you had done all yes, of this? Yes, you would this? be fully conscious. Uh, locally, according to Einstein, uh, you would be in an ordinary space-time frame. So as you went backwards in time, you would never notice any of these bizarre distortions. Um, of course, people around you would notice these things. But locally, it, space looks flat. Okay, So the, locally, time beats normally for you, and you think you're pretty much at rest. Okay. Well, actually, what you've done is you've whipped around the universe. Huh. Um, is there any rule or law that would tell you when you took that one step uh, how many years um, or how much space you'd be traversing? Or would it all be just a guess? Well, it would be a guess. However, in principle, if you knew the location of all the stars, if you knew the location of all the objects in the universe, yes. you could just plug that into Einstein's equations, yes. and then Einstein's equations would tell you when you, at what point in the past or the future you, you wound up. Would this be a, a specific or controllable thing? In other words, uh, would the amount of negative matter um, always reliably determine that you were going to go back to 1967, for example, every time you walk through, and uh, and only an adjustment of the amount of energy or the am amount of negative matter would, would change that. Uh, well, of course, it would take a supercomputer to do this calculation, but in principle, if you knew the location of the stars, the location of the distribution of negative matter, you could plug this into Einstein's equation, and it would predict where you are going to wind up when you go through the ring. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, whether it's tunable or not, that's another question. <laughs> whether you can fine-tune it so that you wind up on yesterday, exactly you know, 24 hours previous to where you are, yes. that would require an enormous amount of tuning. And I tend to think, doubt that you could tune it that much. But all I'm saying is it's probably predictable as to where you're going to wind up. If you know the geometry of these configurations, Einstein's equations are quite explicit. Uh, you will wind up at a certain point in space and time that's calculable. That's incredible. Uh, all right. Um, scientists, as we know, recently um, have claimed uh, teleportation. They've actually they've said that they've uh, teleported, I think, a molecule of light or some such. I can't exactly. A call. photon of light. Photon of light. Yeah, there you are. And uh, they, they've done that. Um, it's a first step, um, a first really small little baby step, but doesn't that put us pretty close to understanding, to take, you know, an understanding that will allow bigger step, much bigger steps? Uh, in principle, uh, the proof of principle is the hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, we want to teleport a, an electron, not just a photon of light, but real atoms uh, yes. across this device. And I suspect that maybe within a few decades, we may be able to teleport a virus. Uh, a virus is not that complicated. Uh, we're, we're talking about um, a bunch of molecules put together in the form of a virus and perhaps even, you know, teleport primitive life forms this way. But, well, a, vi a virus is a sort of primitive life form, form itself, isn't it? Yeah, but the problems are enormous. Uh, the, the technical difficulties involved in what is called quantum entanglement are, are really stretching the borders of our technology. And it may take centuries uh, before we can do anything more than just teleport a, a, a bunch of molecules, okay? So I personally think that teleportation is really for type 1 or type 2 civilizations. Uh, we are talking, I think, on a time scan of centuries uh, before we can do anything more than just a few subatomic particles. While, of course, you know, that doesn't help you. Yeah, you know, while we're on the subject of viruses... Um, uh, scientists 
I just read a story, it's dated today, and it says, Within ice that covers a salty, liquid Antarctic lake, scientists have found and revived microbes that were at least 2,800 years old. Now, what they did is they drilled down up in the Antarctic into this ice. I didn't know they were doing that. Well, I guess I did. And uh, I knew they were drilling, but I didn't know that they were reviving. Basically, the scientist involved uh, was quoted as saying, all you got to do is warm it up and add water. And these <laughs> things are there and alive. Right. I think it was uh, 28,000 years. Uh, by drilling into the um, ice well, caps. 28,000? Well, it says 2,800 here. This is uh, from, uh, I think, nature. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Well, maybe you're right. But if you drill into the ice, you know how far backwards in time you're going because we can oh, calibrate yeah. the ice layers. Uh, we know when certain volcanoes erupted, for example, and volcanoes l uh, lay down a layer of soot. And by drilling into the ice, you can see these layers of soot as you drill deeper and deeper into the ice. And by this way, you can calibrate how far you are digging. Absolutely. But, and, I, you know, I, I was just wondering, is this really smart? I think it's not such a great idea because who knows what kinds of things you're going to find down there. Maybe, you know, better let uh, sleeping dogs lie, as they say. Oh. Um, because, you know... Uh, who knows what kinds of diseases existed back then um, and whether or not we have any immunity to them. I, I think we ought to test these uh, on mammals uh, before we begin to unleash these things yeah, into the environment. that's exactly my thought. Um, uh, you know, that's exactly my thought. I said in the first hour, I also noted then that, you know, um, even, even if we don't have scientists going up there with their drills and their little heaters, uh, then we've got stories like this, record melt in Arctic and Greenland. Uh, Mother Nature is uh, busily uh, doing it for the scientists. I mean, you know, things are melting like crazy, and eventually one of these little guys is going to melt and warm up all on its own. Yes, I think this is one of the areas where we have to be very careful. Another area where we have to be careful is where scientists are creating artificial life. Uh, they're oh, yeah. actually taking pieces of cells oh, yes. and taking the minimal number of genes, the minimal number of genes necessary to sustain life. I read the story the other day. Right. This and I think that uh, that gives you pause because who knows what kind of bizarre cells you're going to create and cells reproduce. That's what they do. They it's, reproduce. In fact, they're designing it to reproduce. And in the story they said that, um, well, yeah, there might be some danger, but they said, we're specifically hobbling these little guys so that should they jump out of the Petri dish, they wouldn't be able to survive in our atmosphere. We're, we're intentionally, in some way, designing them, design our little lives, uh, so that uh, they can't survive in our environment. Until they mutate. And let's say they, <laughs> let's say they mutate so they can't yes. live in an oxygen-bearing atmosphere. So you're saying that's a possibility. Yeah, I think that nature is much more clever uh, than most scientists uh, give uh, her credit for. And there's always a chance that a mutation could uh, uh, rearm or re-enable this uh, microbe to exist at room temperature in a normal atmosphere, in which case God knows what we've unleashed on the world. And, again, we're talking about a very small probability, of course, of this happening. Uh -huh. But you cannot, um, you cannot recall a genetically modified organism. You can recall a Ford car that has a defect in it, yeah. but you cannot recall a germ that has mutated so that it can survive in our atmosphere and under normal conditions, and it will multiply. That's what they do. Well, um... Is this enough of a danger, Professor, that somebody ought to go to these scientists and say, hey, guys, listen, you might be, of course, they really know, but, I mean, there is this possibility, and, you know, other controls really ought to be in place before we uh, gene mix anything else to life here. We have to be very careful, like in the Arctic, for example. Uh, they're digging up corpses of individuals that died during the last flu epidemic wow. of the 1920s. Wow. It was one of the greatest flu epidemics of all time. Yep. We have no traces of this flu that we can look at with our DNA analysis. So we're digging up corpses uh, that are buried in the ice for many decades. 
And this has this is being done under extreme under extreme um, conditions, security conditions, because yes. we don't want this flu to get out uh, because it, it devastated uh, tens of millions of people last time it got out. So what's the rationale for digging it up? Uh, well, they want to find out what. It, now that we have DNA technology, uh, we can begin to at, look at exactly what is it that made it so dangerous. We can actually see on the genetic level how it was armed, how the genes armed themselves to the point where it could just wipe out whole populations. Right. It killed more people than, than World War One. And so So you don't think there's any possibility that they would dig it up and then it would be turned over instead of um, to the scientists you would hope it would go to, but it might get turned over to our bio warfare people who would try and figure out how to make it even more dangerous than it is now. They wouldn't do that, though, would they? Well, it's happened in the past at Fort Detrick. They would do it? At Fort Detrick outside Washington, D.C. They, they have a whole it. rogues gallery of different kinds of designer germs, one of which, by the way, almost escaped uh, several years ago. It was, really? It was actually in the newspapers. And, of course, people said that if it wiped out Washington, D.C., we would, of course, not have any big, uh, you know, effect on the nation's uh, politics anyway. <laughs> but the point is that it is outside Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. And we are experimenting with designer germs how, uh, how, right outside how, the nation's capital. How close did it actually get to getting out? Uh, well, the newspaper reports are sketchy because, of course, it's been classified. Uh, but it's kind of scary. The, 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 even the fact that it was mentioned, uh, the fact that there was an incident, gives you pause. Professor, hold tight. We're uh, at the top of the hour. Well, you know, I just didn't know about that. I wonder how close whatever it is came to getting out. Listening to Art Bell somewhere in time. Tonight featuring a replay of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. Isn't it strange uh, that uh, Dr. Kaku would mention this thing about the simple first genetic structure that we're creating? Uh, we're actually creating life. I just, I mean, I went off on this for almost a week. I totally went off on it when I read the story because that's what we're doing. We're, we're getting into the creation business. We are creating life and to that life if it could point to its maker it would point to us I did. I, I went off on this whole subject real heavily uh, for about a week, uh, Professor. I just was startled when I read this story, and I don't know that it hit every, everybody the same way, but to me, that was uh, the first step in putting us in the creation business. I mean, if you could eventually ask some more complex organism that we would create in the same manner um, about its creator, hmm, it would point right at us. We would be its creator. That puts us in the God business, in the creation business business, it seems to me, or at least the first step in that. Is that out of line? No, I think that's where it's headed for. Uh -huh. And I should caution that initially we are talking about tiny microbes that you can't even see, and the chances of this happening are very close to zero. Yeah. However, you can't rule it out because, of course, mutations happen quite rapidly in the, in the, in the microbial world. Well, that's what nature does, right? And that's what nature does. I mean, the microbes do mutate. That's this is have, evolution. Uh, that, that's evolution. That's why we have uh, germs that are resistant to antibiotics. They evolve. Mm -hmm. They evolve to be resistant to antibiotics. And these little little microbes that uh, we are essentially going to design from first principles mm -hmm. will have the, uh, the minimum number of genes necessary to survive. And they may survive in ways that are totally alien to ordinary uh, life. Yeah. And if some of them escape into the environment... Yeah. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? Well, I do a little, and that's why I went so heavily off on this, and it's not like a lot of people got it. It's like uh, this is such an incredible thing that's being done right now. I think that um, a public debate about this is not forthcoming, mostly because the American people are, by and large, kind of ignorant about science. That's right. Uh, however, <laughs> if you uh, live in Mexico or Latin America, you know all about killer bees. 
uh, killer bees were accidentally released in uh, Brazil in the 1950s. A few queens escaped from the station there. Just a few. And these Africanized uh, killer bees then began to displace yeah. uh, the weaker European honeybees. And now they're creeping into Texas and they're creeping into California. Big oops. And you cannot recall these things. And again, this is an extreme case, uh, but it shows you that life will prevail that life forms will struggle to survive, and that, uh, you know, organisms will mutate to survive in the environment. And even though they can't survive now, um, perhaps the mutation will, will make one of these things uh, survive in the future. So shouldn't there be, I don't know, some kind of public debate? Maybe the public isn't capable of it. Uh, some panel, some uh, congressional or Senate committee looking into all of this or something? Yes, but unfortunately right now, like you said, most people are ignorant of this problem, and I think some oversight is called for. We are talking about big stakes. It's not just an academic question of some scientists getting their name in the lights and winning a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, we are talking about creating life forms with unforeseen consequences, and again, 99% of the time it's going to be perfectly safe with nothing to worry about. However, it's that 1% that bothers me. Uh, bothers me, too. Uh, uh, for example, um Let's move quickly to cloning. I mean, that's a close relative. Uh, cloning, oh, my goodness, is it moving fast? I've got, a, I've got a story right here that says that, let's see, the race to clone the first human appears to have intensified after claims that a second team is about to begin experiments to clone babies for seven infertile couples. An announcement that the first human baby clone will be born within a few weeks, made last week by a controversial Italian fertility expert, Dr. Servino and. Tory was greeted with a mixture of skepticism and contempt, but now his former partner, Dr. Zavos, has dismissed Dr. Tory's claims and announced that, well, instead, he is pursuing his own program with a specialist in animal cloning, a professor at, European, at a European university, and he is, says he is just about to uh, clone uh, 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 himself, a human, and then uh, store it in uh, nitrogen at an undisclosed location, or that it already is, I'm sorry, and will uh, is about to be used, and he's going to create the clone. So here we go. Right. See, we know that it's possible to clone a human. That's known. The p problem is you have hundreds of defective embryos and fetuses that are created, horribly deformed uh, creatures that will never see the light of day. Monsters. And monsters. And it's a hit or miss process. And we've now genetically looked at the genes of cloned animals, and we find hundreds, hundreds of mutations. And, of course, you can't see them, you know, visibly when you look at a, at a cloned sheep or a cloned pet. However, we know at the genetic level that hundreds of mutations are introduced so this is unethical. We are creating, if you clone a human, uh, you would have to create hundreds of deformed embryos, and, uh, the, and the human that is born is going to have hundreds of mutations in them, and it is totally unethical. And just because some idiot scientist wants to have their name in the newspaper, uh -huh. uh, we're going to be performing, we're going to see these scientists perform unethical experiments, and I personally think it may take decades before we iron out this hit-or-miss process by which the cloning process takes place. Right. Now, in the late, recent Star Trek movie, uh, that's also based on cloning when uh, uh, Jean-Luc Picard's uh, DNA gets cloned. But that's in the 23rd century, okay, where they have plenty of time, hundreds of years, to, to iron out the defects in the cloning process. Having said all this, though, do you doubt for one second that they're really in Italy or wherever all right now, they're doing this? There probably are. However, uh, these unfortunate women will give birth in January to deformed uh, fetuses. Uh, if they even reach that far, uh, these individuals will probably be horribly deformed. And I think at that point people are going to be shocked at the uh, brutality of, of, the, of these scientists who just plunge ahead with this very untested technology. So I think we're playing with life here. We're not just doing a science experiment to get your name in the newspaper. We are talking about life and this life will be deformed, sad to say. So it's going to happen. Yeah. However, at, at Stanford University, I've taken, I think they've taken a more measured approach. Uh, all they want to do is clone stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and that, in turn, can open up a cornucopia of uh, new therapies to cure diabetes, uh, cure heart disease, uh, cure uh, you know, diseases of the kidneys, 
spinal cord injuries. Well, what, why, why should we believe that stem cells could be cloned uh, safely without serious mutation uh, if, you, if your thought is to use these stem cells in research and cures, which I'm sure it is, uh, why should we imagine they would be cloned any, any more safely than Dolly or Harry or well, Antonio in this case, I guess? Well, to take an adult cell that's already differentiated into skin, for example, and you have to do violence to it so that it reverts back to its embryonic state and then it starts to reproduce, you have to do a tremendous amount of genetic violence to an adult cell to do this. Huh. Embryonic stem cells are embry embryonic. You don't, they, they naturally, uh, practically naturally want to, uh, you know, develop into different kinds of, of uh, or tissues of the body. And so we're not talking about the genetic violence that is done to adult cells that have already differentiated. Uh, we're talking about stem cells that naturally want to become uh, kidneys and, and pancreas cells and lung cells. And so I think that uh, within 10, 20 years, we will see the beginning of a human body shop. Um, already we can begin the process of cloning skin, uh, bone marrow to a degree, and I think within uh, 10 years or so, perhaps the first liver or portions of liver uh, will, be, will be grown in the laboratory, unless, of course, the Bush administration puts a halt to these tests. Well, that was going to be where I was going to go next. I mean, there's a big controversy about it. You know, they say stem cells um, can only be obtained from <laughs> fetuses, right? And they're going to be discarded anyway. There are literally thousands of these fetuses sitting in liquid nitrogen vats from fertility clinics. They're going to be thrown away, and they're going to be discarded and, and, and flushed down the toilet or put into into a, a trash compactor. And the most uh, or the strongest argument that you could muster that we should not do that would be? Would be that we're talking about uh, a new generation of medicine. Uh, medicine that simply doesn't try to stimulate the immune system, uh, but medicine based on replaceable human body parts uh, to extend the human lifespan, to increase longevity, to, to make the human life uh, more fulfilling. Uh, look, look at Christopher Reeve. Here, here's a vital individual that's just sitting there uh, immobilized because his spinal cord is severed near the top. Yes. We can grow uh, new kinds of nerve cells with embryonic stem cells if the government will provide funding for this new technology. This is proven in the Petri dish. We want to then prove it with, uh, with animals and eventually with humans. And it's a technology that's sitting there unless ideologues get their hands on it, in which case we're going to have a brain drain, uh, not a brain drain to America, a brain drain away from America. Okay? Uh -huh. Scientists are going to go where the funds are, and the funds are going to be in Europe. And the funds are going to be in different countries which do, do not have ideologues uh, that are deciding science policy. You do understand the sensitivity to it, right? I understand. I also understand the precious nature of human life. And why should we condone suffering? Why should we condone human suffering when it's needless? Okay? I mean, look, within our own family tree. I mean, think of our relatives who are suffering from debilitating diseases. Uh, in fact, for example, diabetes will be an epidemic as baby boomers start to age. They have, of course, an awful lifestyle. They load their overweight. They load themselves with sugar. We're going to see a massive explosion of diabetes, which is going to strain our Medicare system. And it could break the bank when, when baby boomers start to age. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be better to simply, you know, grow new aisles of Langer hands for the pancreas of these individuals so it doesn't break the treasury of the United States? Look at the cost of medical care in this country. It is skyrocketing. And it's going to get worse as baby boomers uh, start to age and as their pancreas wears out and they become diabetic and they become blind and they have to have their toes and fingers amputated. Uh, look at Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, she, she's diabetic. She may go blind very soon, and she's worried about that possibility. And why? It is totally unnecessary. When we could be turning out pancreases by the tens of thousands, right? hundreds cells of thousands. Right, that are going to be thrown away. Uh -huh. Think about that. Discarded. Thousands of these fetuses sitting in uh, fertility labs and vats of liquid nitrogen. One day somebody will simply turn off the temperature control of these liquid nitrogen vats, and the, the fetuses will simply decay at room temperature, and that's it. While these cells could be regenerating nerve cells, pancreases, kidneys, lungs, skin, bone. Conceivably any human part. That's right. There are 200 different kinds of tissue in the human body, all 200. 
perhaps can be grown in the laboratory to extend the lifespan and, and eliminate human suffering. Why should people suffer? That's, that's the bottom line, I think. That uh, eclipses all in your mind, um, and I mean all. I, we should just proceed ahead. There should be no uh, control over this at all. Well, I think there should be oversight, okay, because, of course, some individuals will be tempted to bring one of these clones to maturity, in which case you have all the ethical oh, yes. problems of human cloning, and you have all the ethical debates with regards to whether or not somebody will steal a piece of your skin and, and clone uh, another individual that looks just like you without your permission. <laughs> so, you know, to our bells, as <laughs> somebody stole some of your hair follicles. <laughs> oh, they'd be working on it now. Uh, so, so, Oversight, perhaps, but not n not a full stop. We should definitely proceed with this, and that would be a, we, we, any human part of it. You could grow a new arm. Uh, well, well, take a look at lizards. Uh, lizards grow new arms. Uh, we've seen lizards they with do. their arms broken off. How do they do it? I don't know. I, I, you're cells. the scientist. How do they do it? They do it with stem cells. That's how Mother Nature does it. Do they really? Uh, is that what they're using? That's stem what they use. This is as as uh, as natural as as stem cells found in nature. Nature does this all the time. Regenerate uh, organs for uh, salamanders and frogs and lizards. Uh, of course, we separated from them about 500 million years ago, so we lost that capability. But other life forms uh, regenerate uh, whole organs. They do it with stem cells. It's oh, natural. of course, you know, a lot of people say, well, look, if God had meant us to regrow an arm, if we lose one, then we'd damn well have more stem cells in our body, and our bodies would do it. God didn't intend for that. Well, in which case, let's go back to the caves and, and turn off sanitation and medical care and, and not have MTV anymore. <laughs> if God wanted us to have MTV, he would have put a, a TV uh, monitors in our eyeballs. A lot of people would lose their arms before they'd give up their MTV. Right, and, and the point is this is a natural technology. Nature uses stem cells to regenerate organs in the animal kingdom. It's as natural as nature. Uh, I heard, uh, I think earlier actually in tonight's show, I read a kind of an interesting thing to the audience. I wish I could find it here. Oh, yeah, here it is. Scientists got together, several scientists, decided they could do anything that God could do. They could change weather, create life. They met with God and told him he could leave, that we didn't need him anymore. Well, God said, let's have a contest. Uh, the one that makes a man first wins. If I win, I stay. If I, if you win, I leave. The scientists agreed. God reached down and picked up a handful of dirt. The scientists reached down and picked up a handful of dirt. God said, no, 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 get your own dirt. Did you get that? Yes, I think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, so... But you, as a scientist, you'd rather not deal with that particular question, I take it, would you? The question of. Well, we physicists are the only scientists who can say the word God and not blush. <laughs> so bring it on. <laughs> In other words, that isn't even a concern. As you move forward with science, at no juncture will you ever consider, would you ever imagine that you would have to consider God. In any way, uh, only only the perceivable scientific danger to to man. The ultimate question yes. is where did the laws of physics themselves come from? Okay, and at that point, uh, well, of course, you can argue the Big Bang, you can argue inflation, and different kinds of cosmological scenarios, but that all occurs within the framework of physical law. And then when you ask the question, where does physical law come from, uh, then you have big problems. <laughs> and that's where some scientists invoke God. Yes. Now, Einstein got around the question by saying that uh, God had no choice in creating the universe. Uh, the universe is unique. Uh, there was no other way to create a universe. And, in fact, uh, we think that basic philosophy is correct. Uh, it is extremely difficult to create a universe. Uh, we try to do this with our equations. 99.99% uh, of the time, our equations fall apart when we try to create a stable universe. And the only thing which seems to work is string theory. It's, it's the only game in town, and it seems to be this unique theory that uh, gives, us, gives us a universe. Okay? And then, of course, you may ask the key question. Well, if you're so smart, then, you scientists, where did these string equations come from? 
And at that point, we just throw up our hands and say, we don't know. We uh. just know that perhaps they are unique. They are the only game in town. You cannot create a universe in any other way. But why not have nothing? Why not have nothing instead of something? Well, the very fact that we are here <laughs> discussing this question <laughs> means yes. that, that something has occurred, that is, intelligent life exists, uh, which means that the universe was set into motion. We do have stable protons and stable DNA, stable enough to create life and consciousness. And that, to me, means that a universe must have enormous constraints on it. But but you really wouldn't hesitate to get into the God business, would you? Or what, what, well, what I many, many call the God business? I would hesitate to create new life forms, because we simply don't know what the hell we're doing. Or would you, would you just not call it the God business? Well, I would not get into creating new life forms, because Mother Nature has had millions of years to iron out all the problems. Uh, we've only had a few months to iron out these problems of cells that we're creating out of a test tube. All right, Doctor, hold on. So I guess he just say, well, hey, it's my dirt, too. Let's start even here. Or probably wouldn't imagine the conversation in the first place. From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. You're listening to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring a replay of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. You're listening to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time, on Premier Radio Networks. Tonight, an encore presentation of Coast to Coast AM from December 18th, 2002. Dr. Michio Kaku is here. You know, on the dirt thing, have you ever heard such a pregnant silence in your whole life? I mean, it was just, it was dead silent. <laughs> we'll get right back to Dr. Kaku. Once again, uh, Dr. Michio Kaku. Uh, Dr. Kaku, welcome back. Um, but in a lot of areas, uh, we really are approaching what a lot of people consider to be, you know, the creator's arena uh, of, of things. And I, I take it that, being serious here for a second, you really wouldn't stop yourself from proceeding for that specific reason. You would rather do it uh, because of uh, real scientific danger in proceeding in some of these areas. That's right. When we scientists play God, I think that in terms of theory, like the Big Bang, the unified field theory, string theory, it's okay for scientists to imagine being God to create a universe out of our equations. However, uh, equations can be recalled. Uh, organisms cannot. Yeah. And I think that if we create new life forms, uh, most of the time they're going to be harmless. Uh, they will not survive. And so there's no big problem. But they mutate. And I think we have to be extremely careful that one of these days, just like the killer bees that escaped from this bee station in the 50s in Rio de Janeiro, something's going to get loose. I think that something could get loose. And I think that uh, you, you know, you said that are some, something almost did get loose, and you alluded to it and said, "Well, it's classified, and you know we can't really talk that much about it." How much do you actually know? Do you know more than you can talk about? Uh, we just know that at Fort Detrick, outside Washington D.C., which of course houses much of the designer germs that we've been playing with, even in spite of the 1972. Uh, biowarfare treaty that we signed with the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, that there was uh, an incident that took place, uh, you know, years ago where uh, it almost escaped. And we have many biosafety levels there. Uh, the people there look like uh, people from a space movie with uh, all these gloves and spacesuits to protect themselves from germs. Right. And it only takes one mistake, uh, one careless mistake for some germ to escape from that laboratory. And that's the price we pay for, for playing, tinkering with uh, germs like uh, Ebola and Rift Valley fever, dengue fever, and uh, different kinds of uh, germs for which we uh, largely don't have cures. You heard about this uh, nasty little thing going around on uh, cruise ships, this Norwalk thing. It's uh, kind of puzzling. It uh, seems to be affecting uh, uh, cruise ships and uh, again and again and again, despite all the scrubbing and everything that's on there. We just keep hearing about these new ships coming down with this Norwalk thing. and Well, apparently uh, 100, as little as 100 particles of the virus are enough to set off this uh, Norwalk-like uh, illness. 
and you can't even see 100 viruses. And that's all it takes to, to be placed in the nose of a test subject to induce the symptoms or to ingest it into your stomach. So I think uh, we're talking about something that is very common. It's uh, one of the most common illnesses in the United States, but it doesn't propagate very far because most people don't spend uh, weeks at a time in a cruise ship. A cruise ship is the ideal incubator for these things. Well, see, there's something I was going to bring up. Uh, a cruise ship is like a little enclosed environment, protected um, in the long run by mm, miles and hundreds of miles of salt water. It's just isolated out there on the water and why something, it would be almost the ideal place to test something, wouldn't it? That's right. In fact, uh, you know, uh, when European cities got off the ground, you know, 5,000 years ago, uh, that provided an ideal environment for ancient illnesses that we've always lived with, you know, these diseases are millions of years old, to, to propagate in cities because of the close contact that we've had. And, of course, I'm not saying they're doing that, of course. I'm just saying, theoretically, it would be... Uh... Uh, yeah, well, I think it's natural. I think they traced it to a few individuals that came on board with the illness that so then I'm infected right. everybody else. It just takes one individual uh, to infect the entire ship. And I think uh, that that's the price you pay for, for being in this confined environment, uh, which is ideal for germs, and uh, they propagate like crazy. A handshake, a sneeze, uh, a fecal matter, anything. In, in the air could, could set this thing off. You know, you and I have talked a lot about black holes before, and here's an interesting Associated Press Science article. In a, in the headline says, Telescope sees black holes merging. Uh, in a looming collision of giants, two supermassive black holes are drifting toward a violent merger and an eruption of energy that is going to warp the fabric of space. It is all happening in a bright galaxy only 400 million light years away. Now, right. uh, Chandra, I guess, uh, found this, this X-ray observatory, uh, is 400 million light years away um, a nice, safe distance to observe a couple black holes kissing? That's right. Uh, the nearest galaxy to ours is only 2 million light years away, and we think that galaxy that you mentioned is a byproduct of two colliding galaxies. When two galaxies collide, their uh -huh. black holes begin to dance around each other. Really? And if you take a look at Andromeda, actually, our closest neighbor, you actually see two blips in the center, which means that Andromeda probably ate up another smaller galaxy years ago. And by the way, our galaxy may be on a collision course with Andromeda, and the future of our own Milky Way galaxy may be to have a hostile takeover, uh -huh. and uh, the atoms of our body may very well wind up in the center of Andromeda, uh, orbiting around the black hole at the center. So Andromeda apparently has eaten other, other objects in the past, and we see that in the belly of the galaxy with our radio uh, X-ray telescopes. And that's where we, we may wind up eventually if, uh, you know, in 10 billion years we actually collide with Andromeda, which is about twice as big as our galaxy. If a collision of that sort occurred, um, I take it we would see it coming for a, a you know a very long time. Millions of years, right? So uh -huh. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> However, it would be quite dramatic seeing Andromeda get bigger and bigger with time, and and seeing the the two star clusters collide. Basically, um, individual star collisions will be rare because, of course, a galaxy is basically made out of nothing. But when stars do collide, it would be spectacular. And when the two black holes at the center collide, it would be quite something. There's a black hole at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Can you imagine uh, an Earth involved in such a, in such a collision? Um, when the time got near, what would be the first things that somebody like yourself imagines would begin to occur that we would notice? Well, we would notice the fact that dust clouds are colliding with other dust clouds, heating things up. And so as we got closer, we would see the blackness of outer space glow because, of course, uh, uh, clouds are much larger than stars, and stellar collisions would be quite rare, but we would see a flaming of, of dust clouds in the sky, and we'd probably see a few stars passing by us as we got closer. Oh. And, um, you know, the sun goes around a black hole, uh, which is at the center of the Milky Way, and that black hole and the black hole in uh, Andromeda would be uh, gravitationally attracted to each other, and they may execute this dance that we see in this galaxy that you mentioned, which is much older than ours, we think. And we think that, uh, yes, our, our atoms, too, may eventually wind up in the belly of Andromeda. 
<laughs> we, we may be a very big lunch for that galaxy. But, I mean, physically on the Earth, how would it proceed? Would, would, there, would it be a slow but sure change, or would there be an instant of catastrophic ending? Oh, it would be very gradual. You know, our Very sun, gradual. Our sun will probably turn into a red giant in 5 billion years. And so way before that, way before we get eaten up by Andromeda, our sun will actually uh, begin to get larger and the sky will be on fire. So it's not going to be pleasant when the oceans boil, the mountains melt, and the sky's on fire. And even within a scale of one billion years, uh, the nearest astronomical catastrophe is when the Earth's wobble around the sun starts to get larger and larger. You see, the moon is leaving us slowly but surely. And the moon helps to stabilize the spin of the Earth. If it wasn't for the moon, the, the Earth would have spun like a gyroscope that's out of control. Now I, knew, now, I know about the moon, but I didn't know it was leaving. Yeah, the moon is gradually leaving us because of tidal forces. It's a very slow uh, leaving of the Earth. We can actually measure that, by the way, with laser beams. We can shoot laser beams off the moon and calculate how far the moon is to within a few inches to a few feet. Well, is there ever a moment where the, uh, the moon will get far enough uh, away from us that all of a sudden we release, in, in essence, its hold on us. You know, the, the, the amount of mass is only so much, the amount of gravity is so much, and uh, its hold suddenly gets released and the moon just goes shh. Uh, well, it, the moon will always be influenced by the gravity of the Earth. Uh, however, it will get farther and farther away from the Earth, and it will cease to stabilize the Earth, and the Earth could begin to wobble quite dramatically in a billion years. And we think that Mars, by the way, is entering that phase, is already in that phase. And we think that the, the polar caps of Mars weren't always the polar caps of Mars. Um, and this could be done with supercomputer calculations. Uh, they can calculate what the Earth is going to look like billions of years from now. And we know that after about a billion years, the moon will be so far from the Earth that the 23-degree tilt of the Earth that gives us summer, fall, winter, spring yes. could wobble. And wobble quite dramatically. Wobbling is probably not good. Not good at all. Uh, it could mean that the pole caps could move as the Earth begins to spin in different directions. Uh, so the Earth has been quite stable for, for four and a half billion years because of our, our moon. However, that's not going to last forever. Would the passage of another planetary body um, of equal or greater mass uh, than the Earth itself, uh, a nearby passage um, also uh, caused this kind of wobble? I mean, just, just theoretically. Well, uh, is theoretically, that... yes. It could definitely uh, tug on the Earth. Uh, we do know that when uh, stars uh, explode or what have you, uh, there's a possibility that planets could be set adrift, and we wouldn't see them. Uh, they would be dark planets just drifting in out of space but huh. because they are no longer tugged by their own star's gravity. And this is purely hypothetical. I don't they would become happen. rogue planets. They would become rogue planets, right. And if they came by the Earth, uh, yes, definitely it would cause the Earth to wobble, wobble. out of its orbit. And uh, it would create uh, huge catastrophes on the Earth, uh, flooding, uh, the weather would go berserk, earthquakes, uh, large portions of the Earth crust would gra gradually begin to, to shatter. Uh -huh. It would not be very pleasant if a nearby planet came close to the Earth. And these nearby planets, or these planets, uh, excuse me, these rogue planets do indeed theoretically exist. In other words, they're not under a major influence of any particular uh, body at all. They That's simply right. They've are... uh, basically been released from the gravitational pull of their mother star. And again, I don't expect to see this happen, but if it were to happen, we would have very little notice. Uh, because planets do not give off light. And uh, so anything wandering in the vicinity of the solar system could definitely... We wouldn't uh, see the it. Of the Earth. We wouldn't see it coming. Uh, we wouldn't see it coming. That's right. Until... When, when, if such a thing would occur, um, Professor, would we ever see it come? I, I assume that we would. In other words, as, as it got within a certain distance, um, our astronomers would begin to notice, now just where did the light from that star go? Uh, at some point, wouldn't they? Uh, it'd be very difficult. Uh, we would notice that the Earth's orbit was gradually being perturbed, that 365 and a quarter days was no longer the, the uh, span of the year, and we would have very little notice. Now, of course, scientists have also found a wandering black hole in our galaxy. Uh, that is more noticeable because it warps starlight. 
And that's how we identified this wandering black hole, by looking at the, the bending of starlight as it moved. Uh, a planet, however, would not do that. Uh, a planet would not bend starlight. It would be totally invisible. And uh, it could creep up right next to us, and we never know it. And again, it I don't expect that, that to happen. I, I but we're talking you know. theory, that there could yes. be rogue planets out there. We certainly are. Um, all right, I'm going to squeeze in a couple calls here. First time caller line, you're on the air with uh, Professor Kaku. Hi. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Where are you? I'm in Walton, Kentucky. Okay. And uh, I've been wondering about the gravitational effects uh, on mass and its other form, energy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had, uh, say, uh, a mass of uh, one gram and converted it to energy, would the gravitational effect on that mass survive that transformation? Well, the gravity would be the same. Um, gravity responds to both matter and energy. So the gravitational tug, which is very small from a gram of matter, would equal the equivalent energy, which is the energy of several hydrogen bonds, I think, uh, that would be released. And again, it would be very small, uh, but according to Einstein, the gravitational effects are indistinguishable uh, from a distance between matter and energy. They both enter into equations in the same way. And so in Einstein's equations, matter and energy are almost interchangeable. So the gravitational effects will be identical. So when we look at the sun, this actually becomes a practical question. You know, how much of the energy of the sun contributes to the gravitational tug of the sun? And there we have to factor in uh, the energy and the matter when we calculate the gravitational pull coming from the sun. Well, what about this uh, force known as quintessence? Does that have anything to do with this, or is that an entirely different thing? Well, there are many theories of dark matter. Uh, and it makes up, you know, 90% of the matter of the universe, we think, and quintessence is one possible candidate. Um, we don't know for sure what dark matter is made out of. We just know that it's invisible. It, it surrounds the Milky Way galaxy. It makes up most of the universe in terms of matter, and different theories have been proposed, among them quintessence and other theories. My own personal point of view is that string theory has higher harmonics, higher octaves, and the higher octave of the string would be invisible, and that probably makes up most of dark matter because they're stable. Uh, the Photino, for example, is the leading candidate for dark matter right now. It's stable, it's invisible, it's predicted by the theory, and it could make up most of the visible universe. But again, all bits are off because we simply don't know what dark matter is made out of. We know it's out there. We, we can photograph its effects with the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, we simply don't know what it's made out of, which is very embarrassing that most of the universe <laughs> is made out of something we don't have the slightest clue as to what it is. Uh, but that probably holds for us, then, a very bright uh, future, at least a possible bright future, because when we do discover um, the nature of it, uh, then, of course, we'll be on our way to uh, ultimate control of it, right? Well, yes, in the far future. Uh, once we understand the mechanisms that make all these things work, that is the unified field theory, uh, in the same way that we manipulated Newton's laws of gravity to exactly. give us machines. Uh, Professor, we're almost out of time. I, I want to ask you this. Oh, we've been, uh, you and I have been talking for years now, and uh, you know I'm about to retire December 31st, and I just wonder, we've had so many talks about type 0, type 1, type 2 planets. As you observe the state of the world today, are you more or less uh, encouraged, or, or even uh, discouraged perhaps, um, that we are going to graduate to type 1 or blow ourselves to smithereens uh, before making the leap? I, 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 how do you feel today at this well, point? Well, I, I think I'm a little bit more pessimistic than before. Uh, however, I think there are two competing trends. Uh, one trend is negative, uh, yes. that is the greenhouse effect, uh, the fact that we're not going to a solar hydrogen economy, uh, the fact that nuclear weapons are proliferating. But the positive effect is that we are gradually having an Internet, which is, uh, you know, creating a global connection between all peoples of the Earth. Uh -huh. And we are seeing the birth of a, of a Type 1 economy, a Type 1 culture, a Type 1 language, which will be English, and uh, the beginnings of a Type 1 civilization. So I think it's glorious that we could see the beginnings of a Type 1 civilization right before our eyes with the Internet, with the European Union, with, with uh, globalization. And However, there's a downside of globalization. There's mm -hmm. a downside of the greenhouse effect. Mm -hmm. And there's a downside of not going to a solar hydrogen economy. 
So and all I things think considered, I mean, I mean what, my question was, given the current state of the world and the direction that we can all see that we're going in, you think uh, in all probability we're going to lose the race? Well, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I think <laughs> it'll get so bad at a certain point that we're going to have to rein in these weapons. We're going to have to rein in the greenhouse effect. We're going to have to eliminate oil, but only when it gets so bad that the average taxpayer, the average voter, says enough is enough. But I think it's not. We haven't reached that point yet. The average person is not so frustrated that they're going to like get out there and vote with their with their pocketbook to to rein in the greenhouse effect and rein in these weapons and uh, bring on a solar hydrogen economy. We're not there yet. Professor, I think it's be a close call. Where we are, though, is the end of the program. And so, for all these millions of words that you and I have shared, thank you so much over the years. And again, thank you, you know, for being here tonight. Right, my pleasure. Take care, my friend. Good night. Okay. Good night. That's Professor Michio Kaku. That's it this night from the High Desert. I'm Art Bell. Y'all have a good night. Good night. Don't you love her,